And boy, there are many notes for today. In a discussion of the Trinity, guess what we're going to do a lot of today? Racing around Scripture. We're going to be all over the place. If you try to flip your Bible from chapter to chapter with us today, I will lose you. You will not, you'll not be keeping up. So I put all the, uh, the uh, Scriptures on the screen behind me, at least most of them, I think. Uh, so you should be able to kind of keep up that way. But uh, again, if you start flipping, you're probably going to get lost really quickly. You might be ro- lost really quickly anyway, but let's all j- take this little journey of lostness together, shall we? Yeah, all right. How do you relate to yourself? Is that a weird question? It might seem odd to you. You do relate to yourself, right? I mean, you think about yourself in a certain way. You do have sense of knowledge about yourself. You don't walk into the bathroom, see yourself in the mirror and think, who is this stranger in my bathroom? You know who that is. There is a sense of self-identity you have. You have a name. You have to write it down all the time. You put it on checks. And every time you go to the doctor's office, every time you go to the doctor's office and they make you fill out more paperwork, there's your name again. That's who you are, right? But you're more than a name. You have a history. You have experiences. And you have changed throughout your history. You are not, I hope, the same person you were when you were four years old. You've radically altered. And yet it's still you. You know yourself as a certain thing that has a body. This is my body. This is my kidney. This is my elbow. Whose elbow? Whose kidney? You also have a mind. These are my thoughts. And you know that you have a location in physical space, time. You might even be aware that you exist to some degree outside of physical space and time. Do you ever yell at yourself? I was installing tile in our bathroom a few weeks back, and I cannot tell you how many times I audibly, out loud, lectured myself or yelled at myself, come on, Ben, measure twice, cut once. Cutting three, four, five, six times before the tiles went in correctly. Do you ever encourage yourself? Take a deep breath. You got this. Relax. You can do this. You do relate to yourself. You do it all the time. You do it every single day. You're a combination of body, soul, and spirit. This is what the scriptures describe in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23. They are all you in some sense, although they are distinct. They're distinct yet part of the same person. It's somewhat complicated, but it's a complication that we're so used to living in that we rarely even think about it. And yet as complicated as relating to ourselves might be, we have to ask ourselves this question, what is it like to be God relating to God. God, as we encounter him in the scriptures, appears in three different persons, yet they are one in essence. They're equally divine. They are stacked in levels of submissiveness. All three receive worship. All three share credit for accomplishing the same things. They communicate within themselves and to one another. Jesus prayed to the Father, though he is one with the Father. It's admittedly mind-bending. How can a human be expected to understand such things? Well, I'm not sure we comprehensively can. It's possible, it is possible that even in eternity, even when we know him face to face, we will still be uncovering and unraveling the mysteries of the Trinity, how God relates to God. It might be beyond our full comprehension, even eternally so. So why not just resign ourselves to relegating this, the doctrine of the Trinity, to the category of unknowable mystery? We can't know it. Let's just forget about it and not think about it, and then we'll move on. Well, the reason we don't do that with the Trinity is because it's an enigma. It's a mystery that you and I have been invited into. God has said it before us and asked us to come and join him in the midst of this relationship that he has with himself. Knowing God, having genuine relationship with God requires the Father, and it also requires the Son, and it also requires the Holy Spirit the so-called Trinity. This doctrine, this teaching about the Trinity is in many ways central to Christianity. But at the same time, it's one of the least understood pieces of Christian theology. How does God relate to God? Grappling with this question does more than make us better theologians. It informs how he relates to us and how we in turn are meant to relate to him. Are you ready to discuss the Trinity? Let's get going. But first, let's pray. Our Lord and God, um, we approach this with fear and trepidation. 
to, to speak about this, is to speak about something sacred. And so, God, we ask for care and carefulness, both in, in how I speak, please help me, uh, and in, in those who are listening. We ask the blessing of your Holy Spirit to be within us and helping us to navigate this issue. We ask that by the blood of the Lamb, we would be able to unite with you powerfully, not just through our understanding of these principles, but through the relational application of knowing who you are and how you have revealed yourself. God, be with us. Carry us forward all this month. I pray that we would all, at the end of this month, know you better because we spent time together thinking about you. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your love for us. It's in your name we pray. Lord Jesus, amen. We're going to start today by discussing monotheism. Secondarily, we're going to talk about doctrine and the scriptures that are entailed. And lastly, we're going to deal with challenges as we look at the Trinity as an overarching doctrine. Here's how this series is going to run. We're doing overarching doctrine today. And next week, we're going to be doing the Father. And then we're going to be doing... Oh, you guys are smart. And then the Holy Spirit. Oh, good. Man, you guys could preach this. Let's talk monotheism as we get going. Supreme Court uh, nominee Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson was being questioned before Congress to affirm her position uh, in the Supreme Court when she was asked this question, what is a woman? Now, you probably saw this in the news. Knowing how dangerous answering that question was for many who had nominated her for that position, she attempted to evade the question by responding thusly. So the question is, what is a woman? And she said, I'm not a biologist. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a biologist. What? Now, that should strike everyone as odd. It was an obvious dodge, and everyone could see it was a dodge. It was just kind of an absurd answer in a way of not speaking about reality. And and as bad as that is, and as bad as you might recognize that to be, many of us inside and outside of the church excuse ourselves from questions about God with an equally lame dodge. Here it goes. Well, that's difficult. I'm no theologian. If you've ever excused yourself from some complicated or difficult question about God, I have very bad news for you. You are a theologian. Whether you want to be or not, you might be thinking, no, I'm not. I didn't go to Bible college. You don't have to go to Bible college to be a theologian. To be a theologian, you know what a theologian is, right? Theos means God, logos, logic, knowledge of or study of. A theologian is somebody who engages in the logic or study of God. Now, what that means is any, any atheist on the internet who wants to say, there can't be a God and make sounds like, Psh, whatever, uh, they are a theologian. They're not a good theologian, but they're a theologian. They have, they have statements and thoughts about the nature of God. All of us have thoughts, statements, beliefs about the nature of God. The question is whether or not you will be a good theologian, sound, or whether or not you will be a bad theologian and just riddling everyone with tripe. Which do we desire you to be? A good theologian. Amen? To that end, this is why we are studying this, these scriptures that we're going to go through today. This is where we're studying the doctrine of the Trinity. We want to start with thinking about monotheism, the belief in one God. God is one. Now let's break down the term monotheism. Second Greek term we're breaking down today. Mono means one, theos, God, okay? So it's, this is a pronunciation, a theological pronunciation. God is one. There is one God. Now, there are many worldviews and there are many world religions that hold to the belief that there is one God. Uh, approximately 60% of the world's population hold themselves to be monotheistic on some level or another. Many are the Abrahamic faiths, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But there are also non-Judeo uh, Christian different philosophies and ideas that hold that there is, in fact, one God. For instance, deism. Deism is the belief that there is a God who's kind of like a a clockmaker. He winds the clock up of the universe and he sets it loose. But that's still a belief that there is one God. He's not going to intervene, but he still starts the universe running. Well, most of the people who believe and fall in along these lines are people of Abrahamic faiths. Abrahamic faiths are faiths descended from you guys are so smart. You were just on it. Yes. Okay. So we have uh, Judaism. Judaism obviously is the first religious ideology that stems from the Abrahamic line. 
Uh, And in Judaism, enshrined in the law, the law of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, is the idea of one God. Hear, O Israel, this is is called the Shema. Everyone say Shema. All right, the Shema, the, the word Shema is the first word of this passage. It means hear or listen, but it also means obey. Okay, so here's the passage, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, listen, obey, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. How many gods are there? One, okay. Uh, The histories enshrine this in the um, Jewish thought. At the dedication of the temple, Solomon states it plainly. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 60. We're building this temple so that all the peoples of earth may know that the Lord is God and there is no one else. How many gods are there? One, okay. The prophet Isaiah received word from God hammering on polytheism. Many of the prophets hammered on polytheism, many gods. Instead, they say God is one. So for instance, in Isaiah 45, verse 5, I am the Lord and there is no one else. There is no God except me. Isaiah 45, verse 18, similarly says, For the Lord who created the heavens, he is God who formed the earth and made it and established it and did not create it to be a wasteland, but formed it to be inhabited. Orthodox Judaism is thoroughly monotheistic. There's one God. Orthodox Christianity, straight teaching Christianity, is thoroughly monotheistic. There is one God. When Jesus is asked in the New Testament, what is the most important, um, the most important scripture or most important command in the law? He responds, Mark chapter 12, verse 28 and 29, by citing the Shema. There were those who came up and asked him, having listened to him arguing with one, uh, with one another and noticing that Jesus answered them well, asked him, which command is first and most important of all? Jesus answered, the first and most important one is hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Paul expressed monotheism plainly to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is only one God and only one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Or from James, James chapter 2, verse 19. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe that and shudder. They bristle in awe-filled terror. They have seen his wrath. I love the amplified in that one. Islam believes in one God. Now, Islam emerged significantly after Judaism. Uh, more than 2,500 years after Judaism is established, Islam emerged after Christianity, more than 500 years after Christianity was established. But in many ways, Islam is sort of pre-Christian in their theology. What I mean by that is their theology resembles Judaism more than it does Christianity. I would say uh, sort of a skewed imitation of Old Testament Judaism. Um, that seems to be sort of where they fall. Islam arose to prominence amidst a polytheistic culture. They arose in rejection of polytheism. They have a central doctrine called Tahid, which is the teaching that God is one. And they believe that one of the worst things people can do is assign any partner to God. The central confession of Islam is called the Shahada, and it states that there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his messenger. So monotheism is enshrined in Islam. Monotheism is enshrined in Christianity. Monotheism is enshrined in Judaism. But it's not just a religious idea. In fact, I would say this. There are many, and I've, I've known some, who come to belief in one God, not by any of the Abrahamic faiths. In other words, they just sit down and begin thinking about it, and they sort of arrive at the conclusion that there is a God. Romans chapter 1 tells us this is the case. You remember Romans 1, Paul's talking to the church? He says, for since the creation of, of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what's been made, so that men are without excuse. We actually see this in many of the ancient philosophers. There's a philosopher named Xenophanes. He lived uh, in the 500s BC. So he was roughly a contemporary of Daniel uh, and Ezekiel, people like that. Uh, He is one of the most famous and influential philosophers to have ever lived prior to the time of Socrates. And we don't have any extended works by Xenophanes. What we have from Xenophanes are quote after quote after quote from Xenophanes that is listed in some of the who's who of ancient writers and philosophers and even theologians. People like Aristotle or Plutarch or Diogenes Laertes or even church fathers like Clement of Alexandria. They were all citing this ancient Greek philosopher. Xenophanes rejected the traditional Greek accounts of the deities of Olympus. 
He argued instead that reason leads us to understand that any genuine God, the only genuine God, would be very different from the polytheistic conception. Instead, he argued that a true God, a real God, would be unmoving, all-seeing, all-hearing, all-thinking, one who shakes the very cosmos by his mere thoughts. Here's a quote from Xenophanes. God is one, greatest among gods and men, not at all like mortals in body or thought. All of him sees, all of him thinks, all of him hears. This guy did not receive that from Judaism or from Christianity. This guy received that because he started thinking about God and came to these conclusions. Many in the early church began recognizing that Plato and Socrates, in fact, had evidence of similar beliefs. Uh, Socrates, if you've ever studied Socrates, I remember the first time I began reading and translating uh, Socrates back when I was in college studying ancient Greek. I remember just being like slack-jawed half the time, like, he said that? He said that? Because so much of it seemed to be paralleling a lot of Christian thought and ideas. Socrates was on trial for his life at one point. You can read about it in the Apology of Socrates. He's defending his life in front of an Athenian court. And in the midst of that Athenian court, uh, here's here's the charges that were being, being brought against Socrates. Socrates does injustice by corrupting the young and not believing in the gods in whom the city believes but in some other daimonia that are novel, some other spirit that is novel. Throughout the whole work of the Apology of Socrates, whenever he references God, he always does so in the singular. That's weird for ancient Greeks. That is strange. And in the midst of this discussion, he describes that there are other spirits, daimonia, the, the, the term daimonia is the same word we use for demon, it just means spirit agency. So for them, it was not like, you know, a demon with like a pitchfork, right? They're just thinking spirit agency. Throughout the entire work, he says there might be other spirits, daimonia, that may be some form of gods, but that he said that there was a specific daimonia who would come to him, a spirit who would come to him and would not tell him what was true, but would tell him everyone who was speaking falsehood. Now, a lot of New Testament scholars began reading this in the early ages of the church and went, it kind of sounds like the external, like, the external voice of the Holy Spirit to somebody. It's weird. It's almost like he arrived at a lot of the right con- conclusions. By the way, Socrates, I'm not saying that he was a Christian. He clearly existed outside of the Christian context. What I'm saying is he was responding to general revelation in such a way that we should look at that and go, oh, he seems to be recognizing that there is one God. This seems to be a proof text of Romans chapter 1. By the way, um, do you know how he was corrupting the youth? He was telling them that rather than chasing money or concerning themselves with their bodies, they should be attending to their souls. That sounds like a familiar teaching. All of this to say this. Monotheism, I think, is easily derived from nature. We've seen it in innumerable religious ideas when people usually go into uh, cultures that are animistic or polytheistic that believe these other things, and they begin expressing the idea of one God and Father who is over all and through all. Most people are like, oh yeah, we want to know about him. They're not like, wait, what do you mean? They have this sense, this idea that such a God exists. Though that is the case, how do we arrive at the notion that God is not just one, but God is Three, three, and one. Well, the only way you get there is not by general revelation, but by specific revelation. And this is where the doctrine of the Trinity comes from. Let's talk about the doctrine of the Trinity, the scriptures and teachings that get us there. The Trinity is a doctrine. Uh, Does the word doctrine make you uncomfortable? Is that a weird word? Is that a scary Christianese word? The word doctrine just means teaching. What does doctrine mean? Okay, so the doctrine of the Trinity is the teaching about the Trinity. Now, I've encountered several people at several times in my ministry who've really struggled with this doctrine, and one of the major objections that some of the more biblically literate people will bring forth is this one. It's not biblical. The doctrine of the Trinity is not biblical, and when they say that, they generally mean the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. Amen, it isn't. You can check your concordance if you don't believe me. It's not there. With that said... You don't need to be committed to the word Trinity, but you do have to be committed to the ideas that that word represents. If you think you found a better word for the triune God, have at it. Use that word. But you do have to affirm the doctrines that that term is referencing. 
Okay, so how do we reconcile one and three? First of all, how do we even get this? And what is the doctrine? Here is the doctrine of the Trinity. You're going to all need to memorize this. There will be a test. Later. The doctrine of the Trinity is as follows. This is orthodox. This is orthodox Christianity in every orthodox Christian church that is out there. God is three persons and one essence. Three persons, one essence, or three persons and one being. Okay? This is the way it's established in the Nicene Creed. This is how it was talked about before the Nicene Creed even emerged. Three persons, one essence, or one being. Now, if you hear that, your immediate response should be, okay, what is an essence or being? What is a person? If we don't define those terms, we have no idea what the other things mean. So let's define what a being is. A being is something's essential whatness. Oh, that helps. A being is something's essential whatness, the whatness of something. So for instance, a red maple is what sort of being? A tree. You guys are good. What is a Norway spruce? It's a tree. It's essential whatness. So though you approach a red maple, and if you approach one in my yard, you'll see a different red maple than you see maybe in your yard or out on the side of the road somewhere. But you don't walk up to that going, what is this novel thing? I've never encountered something like this. I mean, I, I've seen something like this, but this is completely new. Now, they are completely different, right? A tree's not branching in the same direction. Those are separate leaves. There's something very differentiated between them, but we recognize there is an essential treeness. That is the what. All right, so if there is a certain what to a tree, what is your certain what? What kind of being are you? Oh, good. I'm so glad someone said it. A human being, that is your essential essence. That is your whatness. I am a human being. That is the what of me. Now that contains a lot of features. I have eyes and I have elbows and a lot of other things that you would expect to be in a human being. But if you remove my eyes or my elbows, I'm still a human being. It's my essential whatness. But if somebody were to walk in this room right now and they were to be like, hey, where is the human being? You wouldn't all like point at me right? Because I'm a human being. I'm not the human being. To get at the, we need to actually experience personhood. A person, by contrast, rather than being a being or simply an essence, a person is a specific someone, a designated person. I am Ben. Thank you. I'm a specific person, occupying specific space. If someone came into this room and said, where is Ben Walker? You could rightly point at me, unless I were in the bathroom and weren't in this room, and then you couldn't rightly point at me. I am a person. I am more than a nature or a being. I have personality. I have a sense of identity and self. With humans, here's where this gets complicated. We are each one person, one essence. All right? I'm part of a greater humanity, but I am a human. I am not the human. I am also one person. God is three persons, one essence. Nabil Qureshi uh, was a Muslim who converted to Christianity, and as such, he had to really come to grips with this idea of the Trinity. And then he had to explain it as much of his ministry was geared toward Muslims. He had to be able to explain the Trinity to non-Trinitarian Muslims. And so here's what he said. Listen to this. He said, God is one what, but three who's. God is one what, but three who's. Another way to express this is to state that God is tri-personal. Okay, so how do we arrive at this? Let's go into the scriptural navigation. And again, we're going to blow through a whole lot of scripture here. So uh, stick with us. Just watch what's on the screen. It'll be much easier. And you can look at your sermon notes. All the references are there if you want to look this stuff up later too. Okay, scriptural foundation. Here's the deal. The reason we believe God is tripersonal or there are certain things that only God can do. Certain things that only God can do. For instance, who can create the cosmos? Good answer, guys. Now, you are Trinitarians, I assume. So which person of the Godhead created the cosmos? I heard several different answers, and you are correct. Let's look at what the scripture says. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Yet for us, there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things. Okay, so God made the universe. One God and Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. 
and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. So who made the cosmos? God. Yeah, you're always going to be right there. (laughs) The Father and the Son seem to both be involved in that process. Genesis 1, 1 and 2 says something different, though. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and the darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So now we're presumably talking about the Spirit. And then what do we read in verse 3? Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. In other words, the Spirit's also involved here. John 1, verse 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who is the Word? Jesus is the word, okay? Verse two, he was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Okay, so the son's definitely responsible as well. Psalm 33, verse six, listen to this one. And this is cool because it's set within Judaism. Listen to this. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Who's the word? Jesus. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth, their host. Yeah, when you hear breath within the scriptural context, remember the, the term, the ancient term for breath, is this, the ter- both in the Greek and in the Hebrew, was the term for spirit. Who can receive worship, guys? God. Okay, well, there's a problem here. If Jesus is not God, Jesus receives worship at many times in his ministry. Remember when Thomas sees him post-resurrection and falls down and worships him, or when the many people he healed would fall down in front of him and worship him, or in the book of Revelation when Christ returns and all the peoples of all the nations fall down and worship the Lamb. There's a problem if that's not God. Somebody's doing something wrong. So Jesus receives worship and the Father receives worship. Who can send prophets? These are easy answers. God, correct, God. And yet we have in Matthew 23, Jesus says, I'm sending you prophets. Wait, Jesus gets to send prophets too? Yeah, more than that. 2 Peter 1.21 says this, No prophecy was ever, uh, or ever produced by the will of man, but men speak as they were carried along by the Spirit. So where does prophecy come from? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Who can know the thoughts and attitudes of the heart? Who knows what is in man or in God? Well, the answer to that is, I'm giving you the easy ones. God, you're always safe saying God, okay? God can do this. And yet, remember when Jesus is sitting, he's with a bunch of Pharisees at a dinner party, and he knows the thoughts of the Pharisees. He knew their thoughts, and he addressed what they were thinking. Jesus, these things are not hidden to Jesus. Jesus knows what is in the heart of a man. He discerns what is within man. And the Holy Spirit does the same thing. And yet, only God can do this. Who is good? God. Thank you, guys. You're starting to get it. God is good. And there's one portion in Jesus' ministry where somebody comes up to him and they say, good teacher. And Jesus goes, hold on there. You called me good. Only God is good. And it sounds like Jesus is rebuking this person, but Jesus is inviting them to take the next step. And the next step is, you are good. You are God. Who will judge mankind? God, right? Now, wait a second. I think I've read that Jesus will do it. Yes. Acts 17, 31 says, God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man. John 5, 22 says, the father has given all judgment to the son. They're rendered as all judging, as all engaged in the judgment process. So uh, the first thing we might be noticing in scripture is that The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all seem to be doing things that only God can do. They all seem to be receiving things that only God can receive. In addition to that, though, there's specific identification of these entities as God. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Remember, Isaiah was writing long before Jesus was on the earth. We have a copy of Isaiah that predates Christ by more than 200 years. And here's what we read in Isaiah 9, verse 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. Pause there real quick. A child is born. Get that, okay. A son is given. That suggests that the son exists before he is born. Oh, 
That makes sense. A child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Now the Jews are monotheistic. How would they have felt about hearing that their Messiah would be born and would also be called God and Eternal Father? Well, that's very confusing unless Jesus is in fact God. Matthew 1, verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God is with us. John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I am the, and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? And the Jews answered him, For good works we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Did they read that rightly? Yeah. They they weren't right to try to stone him. (laughs) But they did read what he was saying rightly. John 14, 9 through 11, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I said to you, I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me, living in me, does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Who can you blaspheme? God. God is the one who is blaspheme. Can you blaspheme Paul? He's a great man. You can't blaspheme him. He's not divine. And yet, what do we see in the New Testament? Acts chapter 5, we've got this instance with Ananias and Sapphira, and they lie to the disciples, and the disciples rebuke them. It is not us you have lied to, but you have lied to the Holy Spirit. And they die. And we're communicated, we're told in the New Testament text that God will forgive all sorts of blasphemies, but not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, all right, a very specific blasphemy, which means the Holy Spirit is God. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 7. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped or clung to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. You remember when Thomas has heard from everybody that Jesus rose from the dead. And he's like, yeah, I'm not going to believe it until I can put my fingers in the holes in his arms, until I can insert my hand in his side. I'm not going to believe that's him. And so Jesus shows up in front of Thomas and he's like, okay, dude, you want to try it? Go ahead. There's the holes. If you want to put your fingers in them, here's the hole in my side. If you like, put your fist in it. Go ahead. Thomas's response is to fall down before the Christ. And he says, ha kurios mu, ha theos mu. Lord of me, God of me. Unacceptable in Judaism if Jesus is not God. So I hope you've seen that the scriptures indicate, first of all, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are doing things that only God can do, experiencing things that only God can experience, knowing things that only God can know. And in addition to that, there are a number of scriptures that specifically identify and attribute Godhood to members of of the the trinity but in addition to that there are triple formations that we see all throughout scripture let's roll through a bunch of these very quickly second corinthians chapter 13 verse 14 the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all why mention all of them because they're equally divine and equally important luke chapter 1 verse 35 here's a cool one this is the angel appearing to mary And he says to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. You see the Trinity in in the declaration of the angel who shows up to Mary. Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the... Oh, with such enthusiasm. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3, verse 16 and 17. 
After being baptized, this is cool, Jesus is being baptized. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of heaven said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. You see the Trinity right there in Jesus' baptism. John 14, 16 and 17. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he might be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides in you and will be in you. This is Jesus asking the Father to bestow the Spirit, the Trinity. Romans 14, 17 and 18. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen. For he who in this way serves Christ with joy in the Holy Spirit is acceptable to God and approved by men. All three. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. That's a description of the church. This is who the church is with regard to the Trinity. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of ministry, and the same Lord. The Lord is Jesus and how he's referenced in the New Testament. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. Last one, 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. The scriptures point decisively to God as three persons. Now I want to say this, the Bible does not have a single chapter that goes, okay, now we're going to explain to you the Trinity. Instead, this whole scenario is a little bit like the father who hands his son a project and goes, figure this out. And he's a good dad that way because it makes us pursue him and achieve relationship with him from our end, not just from his end. Let's talk about challenges with regard to this piece of theology. So some challenges that might be emerging right away, particularly if you're, if you're not a Christian yet and you're just coming and approaching this theology for the first time, you might be looking at this and going, this is not logical. This violates logic. This, this, this violates the law of non-contradiction. You're saying something is both this and that at the same time. The eminent philosopher and theologian William Lane Craig, perhaps one of the greatest minds in the world today, certainly one of the greatest people to have ever debated the existence of God, He says this, the doctrine of the Trinity is not even apparently logically contradictory. It's not the self-contradictory doctrine that three gods are one God or that one persons are somehow three persons, right? That would be contradiction. As regards pure logic, this does not violate any logical rule. There is no conflict in saying that God is three persons, A violation requires the same category for internal contradiction. In other words, if I said uh, God, our one God is three gods, that would be contradictory. One God is three persons does not contradict. More than that, though, you might actually find this doctrine is a little sensible. What do I mean by that? It actually makes a great deal of sense of how God would be comprised of multiple persons when you consider a few features of who God is. First John tells us that God is love. So a question for you would be, if God is one, who would God be loving prior to creation? Our far God is love. If this is definitionally who he is and how he functions, if he favors community, and that after all is why he apparently created all of us, then it makes sense that he would be multiple persons. And this is exactly what we see within Christian teaching. A single God would be isolated apart from creation. Two gods would have communion, but three gods have community. This is the teaching of Christianity, that God has perfect unity and community within the Trinity. This also is not contrived. You know what I mean by contrived? Like made up, right? Not something that would be completely made up. For instance, your your child comes to you and says, Can I have another cookie? Because mom didn't already give me one. Don't ask mom. 
Okay, now clearly what you're seeing is you're seeing something made up. It's, it's situated in such a way that you're being expected to not look more deeply into it. And it definitely seems like something your kid would make up or my kids would make up anyway. This is not the kind of theolo- or theology that humans would be making up or inventing the Trinity. If we were making up the idea of God, if we were piecing this together, putting it together on our own, if we were creating religion as a fiction, as many people have throughout history, you would never come up with the Trinity. It's too complicated. It's too difficult. When I was in college, I once observed a debate with uh, one of our resident students who happened to be a Christian, and um, the uh, Islamic group on campus brought in a Muslim speaker for the purpose of the debate. He was a trained philosopher and debater, and the Muslim was ridiculing the idea of the Trinity, expressing that this Christian version of God is incomprehensible. And I'll never forget the response of the Christian speaker. He said, if you can comprehensively understand God, perhaps it's not actually God you're thinking about. Shouldn't we expect to be God a little bit hard to wrap our minds around? If God is more than something I engineered in my own mind, should it be the case that there are moments where I approach God and I feel like this is something otherly, this is something holy and strange and weird, and this is difficult? The doctrine of the Trinity emerges from the text in what initially seems baffling. But as you recognize these teachings, you begin to see it not just in the words of Christ, not just in the works of the New Testament authors and the church fathers, but throughout the pages of the Old Testament as well. And beyond that, I was talking to my grandfather before the sermon, and he says, this is a doctrine that is so beautiful for somebody who's been a Christian for a long time. There is a sort of otherliness, a completeness, something bigger, something distinctively holy that we experience as we approach the Trinity. So it is logical, but you might be thinking, couldn't it be more simple? (laughs) Can we just make this a little easier? Well, people have traditionally tried to make this easier in numerous ways. For instance, St. Patrick said, God is like a clover, three in one. He he actually wouldn't have said it that way because St. Patrick was not Irish, he was English. Uh, And I don't think they had an Irish accent at that stage of the game anyway. But you get the idea. God is like a a clover. It's one thing, but it's also three things. And what he did was kind of modalism, which is uh, actually a heresy that we'll talk about a little bit next week. Another says, God is like a man who at once can be both son and father and also a husband. Yeah, but not really. That's also kind of committing a heresy. Or the Trinity is like, uh, it's like water. It's liquid and it's steam and it's ice. Well, this successfully conveys the sort of one essence-ness of God, but it also is limited in the sense that each of these can only be one thing at a time, while God can be all things all at once and in every way. Here's the challenge with a metaphor. The problem with metaphors is that the only perfect metaphor is comparing something to itself. For instance, a dog is like a dog. That's a perfect metaphor. I find no objection in it. It works perfectly. A dog is like a dog. And so you could say God is like God, and amen, that's true. But as soon as you start trying to break this down, while illustrations or metaphor, metaphors might be helpful in helping us to unpack and these, these various aspects of God, they usually end up making as much of a mess as they clear up. Should we expect this doctrine to be simple? No. It's my impression that most attempts to simplify the, dro- the doctrine of the Trinity usually end up being a bit heretical, kind of like an attempt to build an idol or represent God would, of, of necessity, be an offense. If you tried to draw your very best picture of God, how would that be taken? I mean, it falls utterly short. So you might at this stage of the game be thinking, I don't understand. And to you I say, what? You can't comprehensively understand the infinite, eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful being? What's wrong with you? obviously. Okay, so if you don't understand God, perfectly acceptable. If you hear the Trinity and you're like, this is difficult, this hurts my brain, completely acceptable. There's no shame in recognizing that there is a limit to the human capacity to fully comprehend the nature of God. Remember how Paul talked to the the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 13. Here, I'll read from the Amplified. For now, in this time of imperfection, we see 
in a mirror dimly as a blurred reflection, a riddle, an enigma. But then when the time of perfection comes, we will see in reality face to face. Now I know in part, just in fragments, but then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known by God. There's a time where you will get this. Maybe not even completely, but you will get this. It is what we might call a functional mystery. What do I mean by that? Do you have a cell phone? Do you know how it works? You might be thinking, yes, I know how it works. I can press buttons to make it do things and things. And some of you might be thinking, well, yes, I kind of know how it works. And when I don't, I talk to my kids or my grandkids to get them to help me to figure it out. But let me ask you on a deeper level, could you dissect a phone and know what you were looking at? And if you dissected a phone, could you put it back together such that it would work again? Let's make it even worse. I doubt anyone in this room, even if you could do those other things, knows the nuance of satellite technologies, tower structures, reception, atmospheric transmission, component parts, and the like, to actually construct a cell phone and its network from the base elements. Could you do that? I couldn't. The good news for us is that you don't have to know all of that minutia of, a cell, phone, of cell phone technology to answer your phone or to put it on silent let the readers understand for church services <laughs> or to attach it to the charger. When it comes to God, exhaustive knowledge is not necessary for meaningful relationship. No, no. Thank God he meets us in the midst of our ignorance and then trains us in relationship as we go. I want to introduce another Greek term to you today. The term is mystery. Everyone say mystery. In the Greek, mysterion. Ooh, sounds just like mystery. The term mystery, listen to this, means something which is hidden but is in the process of being revealed. Something which is hidden but is in the process of being revealed. It's my opinion that the term mystery most appropriately describes the doctrine of the Trinity. It is something which is known in part and is gradually becoming known in greater and greater fullness. It is a functional mystery. You do not have to have exhaustive knowledge of God in order to relate to him. But with that said, just like any functional relationship, what starts as mystery should gradually be being revealed. You've all been on a date before. Well, no, not all of you. Some of you. In the context of that, the person you go out with is generally a mystery. They could be anything, a serial killer, you don't know. And you're not sure how this is going to work out, but if you have sat down with them, you've been talking with them, gradually the mystery begins to unfurl and you might be like, this person is dingy or this person has views that do not correspond well with my own. But that's fine on a first date and you're figuring things out. But if you've been married for 30 years, should you know a bit more about that person? The mystery should have been unfolded. It doesn't mean you know everything about them yet, and many of you clearly still don't know your spouses. I, I'm still finding things out all the time, right? But gradually, the mystery is dissolved, and things become more revelation. And this is how it is with our Father in heaven. This is why we're pursuing it during the course of this month and discussing this particular mystery. It's our desire that we all be mature in respect to how we know our God. In conclusion today, why are we studying this? If this is already so hard, if my brain is already hurting, why are we getting into this? Oh, I'm supposed to do this. My wife said, stop putting memes up there that distract us from everything you're saying. So get in, loser. We're going to jump to conclusions. I've read it. Now you can join me in the rest of what I'm about to say. <laughs> why are we studying this? Because this is what the scriptures teach. In the scriptures, as you've seen from our discussion today, you're, and you will see over the next several weeks, God is revealed in three persons, and it's necessary that you know those persons if you want to relate rightly to God. Though this doctrine is difficult to wrap our minds around, it is not logically incoherent. There is no contradiction in it. And indeed, I want to remind you, it would be worrisome if you had absolute comprehensive understanding of who God is, because that kind of God you might have made up. Thirdly, and this is, this is perhaps the most important thing I'm going to say today. It will be important for the rest of this series. God is relational, and that relationship does not begin with us. I'm going to say it again because this is important. 
God is relational, and that relationship does not begin with us. You and I have been invited into a pre-existing relationship, and as such, we have to humbly enter by finding our place in that relationship. So, my fellow theologians, all this month I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to go to God in prayer every day, and I want you to just say this prayer. It's very short. You can do it every day. God, I want to know you more fully. Just say it. And throughout your day, I want you to reflect on the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want you to think about what the the different persons of the Trinity entail. But remember, this this is the prayer. God, I want to know you more fully. Can we do that this week? Do you need to write it down on your hands? Or on your neighbor's head? God, I want to know you more fully. Let's talk to that God in prayer. Holy Father, exalted one, King of kings. Our Messiah, Jesus, Lord of lords, Holy Spirit, God within us, we call out to you. Teach us to know you. Reveal yourself to us. Unpack this mystery in each and every one of our lives. May we know you more and more and more. We love you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.